Hello, my name is Paul Franzon, and uh, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me to present this talk, Exploring Early Design Trade-Offs in 3DIC. I apologize I can't be with you in person. I had to add a meeting I have to attend on Tuesday in the United States, and it turned out to be impossible to get back in time for it and, and present this. And I'd th like to thank uh, Yahoo for uh, presenting this for me. So what I'm going to do is a brief technology review, followed by an overview of the overview of the potential in 3D specific design before talking about 3D exploitation models. Uh, and finally, uh, if time permits, talk a little bit about uh, the thermal explorations we've done in, uh, in a pathfinding tool. So here's some 3D alternatives. One thing I want to emphasize here is when you have a face-to-face -face interface, such as shown here, you can have micro bumps at a very high density. This gives a very high bandwidth interface between these two face-to-face -face units, and it's something we've exploited in quite a few of our projects. And you'll, and you'll see one of those coming on. In contrast, if you're doing interconnect through TSVs or through silicon vias, you have a coarser pitch, uh, typically about 25 micron. This is true whether it's back-to-back uh, -back or face-to-back. So this is my personal overview of the 3DIC product space. And I'm very careful here not to actually put dates on the uh, time on the bottom here. To date, there are companies exploring image sensors using 3D, uh, where the, uh, uh, a, uh, an imaging layer is combined with a CMOS processing layer. Many people are familiar with the Interposer work coming from Xilinx. There's a lot of work going on right now in stacking DRAMs, and this is waiting uh, cost reduction to come to play. And that will be quickly followed by 3D Mobile. In our own work, we've been focused lately on the right-hand side. That is heterogeneous CMOS la heterogeneous layers, either of CMOS and other types of silicon, or even different material structures such as gallium nitride and neutrium phosphide. We've been aiming this towards uh, 3D processors as well as other uh, opportunities uh, such as micro miniature sensors. And finally, we've also been looking at how to do what I call extreme 3D integration. That is getting cost-effective chip stacks with more than uh, four chips in them. And, and there's a number of ways and benefits of doing this. In this talk, I, I'll mainly be focusing on the logic aspects related particularly to 3D processors. So fundamentally, 3D gives you shorter wires, uh, which can consume less power and cost you less. And the particular big opportunity hook course here is the memory interface, which I'll talk about first. 3D also gives you heterogeneous integration, where the different, each layer is different or to some it possibly can be con customized to a particular application. And finally, 3D gives you the opportunity to build consolidated superchips. That is, for example, these 3D chip, DDRAM chips, or the interposers such as Xilinx producers, where you can get a silic effective silicon area that's highly interconnected and at a lower cost than if you tried it as a, to build it as a piece of monolithic silicon. So first of all, I'd like to turn to the demand for memory bandwidth. Here's an IBM paper forecasting how DRAM bandwidth requirements will grow uh, with the number of cores in a multi-core computer. And this is predicting half a terabyte per second at 16 cores, which of course translates to a terabyte per second uh, at, uh, um, at uh, 32 cores. And you can see similar demands in other application spaces, such as networking and graphics which I ideally would love to have a 0.1 terabyte, but one terabyte per second memory stack in order to feed the demands of the networking and graphics processor, which today can be made to be uh, have a very high throughput. Another aspect that's related to this is the power performance of, of computing. So this is a chart that I like to use that summarizes the energy per operation for different 64-bit operations. I'm not going to go through this entire chart, but I'd like to highlight a few of these. you notice out of, the, uh, out of these, one that is surprisingly quite power efficient, at least surprising at first blush to many people, is the actual computation. Because of silicon scaling, computation can be done very power efficiently more power efficiently than moving the data off chip, even with low swing I.O., and more power efficiently than storing the data even in an optimized DRAM core. Thus, normally in computation, 
You don't want to move data around and you don't want to store it until you have to because of the high energy cost of doing so. 3D changes this relationship. With 3DIC, with TSVs, you, it is now very power efficient to move the data. So if you can move the data, you now will move the data. And there are many ways to exploit that. And we're going to talk about a few of them in the next few slides. To emphasize this point, uh, here is a power efficiency study that we've just completed for Semitech that actually appear next week at ECTC. And what this is showing is uh, simulated energy efficiency, simulated at the transistor level or using a, a, a mac appropriate macro models. And so this is a very accurate representation of the power efficiency in milliwatts per gigabit per second for different interconnect scenarios. And as you can see, even as you go from a uh, low power DDR3 in a package on package configuration such as used in your cell phone to an optimized CMOS interface with a TSV stack, you can get a power efficiency improvement of almost two orders of magnitude. This is a very dramatic improvement and again leads to the inversion of the interconnect power versus performance power aspect that I talked about in the previous slide. So this, of course, leads to the first logic exploitation of 3D, which is memory on logic. The idea is in a conventional memory interface, you are going through a narrow channel after spending a lot of power uh, stuffing the bits into that channel. You go very fast through that channel, then go through another narrow channel on the chip to redistribute the data on the chip. All this costs a lot of power and reduces the flexibility of access to the memory. In contrast, in a 3D scenario, you treat each bank as if it was an individual memory, or more precisely, each stack of banks. So you can end up with what is essentially 8 or 16 memory ports on this uh, stacked memory. You build a wide data port to, those, to each of those stack of banks, and you do this wide so you can get high bandwidth through it without spending a lot of power on the interface. The interface power then in turn goes down dramatically. And now because you have DRAM interfaces distributed across the surface of the processor, you can have a more flexible, more agile architecture on that processor. And this is of course why there's a lot of interest in memory on logic. For example, the wide IO standards are the, that are being uh, built today. So this is an example of exploring the use of that. Uh, in this work, a Wan Hao Cha PhD student actually did a detailed, uh, accurate ESL model of uh, two different paths, two different scenarios. First of all, the traditional scenario with a, with a mobile graphics unit stacked with LPDDR2 memories. And then a 3D optimized scenario where the mobile graphics unit was stacked with uh, TSV enabled I.O. And the point is here that typically in a mobile application, your total power budget is limited by the, by the quite constrained cooling capacity of the encapsulated chip stack. Typically it's about two watts. So the question then becomes, what can you do within that two watts? Well, in the left-hand scenario here, we have to spend a third of our power on communicating between the CPU slash GPU and the low power memory. In contrast, on the right hand side, we spend a much less of our power on that memory to GPU CPU communications. This in turn allows us within a total power budget to increase the throughput, in this case of the graphics unit, by about 30%, which is a dramatic increase in the graphics capability uh, of a chip uh, and, and thus is very highly beneficial. This is addressing the dark silicon problem where, wherein you can't turn on all the chip because of total power constraints. So this leads me to different modes of partitioning, modular partitioning, cell level partitioning, and partitioning structures I won't talk about much, heterogeneous integration, where we've got a project going on right now where we demonstrated a 30% improvement in power performance, and partitioning across an extreme 3D stack with more than four chips in it. 
I'm only going to focus on the first two of these in the rest of this talk. So here's a, a radar processor that we did a modular partitioning on. Uh, we took a large memory, split into many small memories, and stacked it with a processor array. Because of this particular architecture, the memory bandwidth goes up significantly by about 800%, but going from one large memory to, one, to several small memories dramatically decreases the power consumption of the memories. The chip area actually went up because the memories are smaller and thus take up more area in total uh, for the same memory capacity, but we get this back later in a moment, as you'll see. Here's a floor plan of this chip. What is interesting here is because this actually does an FFT process, and because of the way in which we architected the FFT and floor plan the chip, all communications is vertical. When we need to go between neighboring processing elements, we can do it via the shared memories. Here's a comparison of this specific modular architecture in a 3D chip versus a 2D implementation of the same architecture. And the interesting thing is here that because of the much higher interconnect requirements of this architecture, the total chip area, if built in a 2D process, goes up by 25%. And because the wire load, go, wire load goes up, the speed is a lot better in the 3D process and the power is somewhat better in the 3D process. And this is on top of the power savings in the memory. This is a completely different way of looking at 3D, and that is cell level partitioning. That is, we built two 3D layers, interface them face to face, and used an automated tool flow uh, to uh, partition the cells between the two layers. And this has been built, this is the chip, uh, it works out to 10.3 milliwatt per gigaflox. And to make it tractable in a uh, realistic CAD process, we only did clock distribution within one tier, since there's no such thing as a commercial grade 3D clock distribution tool. And that means all the flip-flops are within one tier. This worked out to be quite beneficial. We, so we did a lot of, uh, we did several studies uh, comparing 2D and 3D implementations of a chip using this automated partitioning process across a high density uh, six micron pitch face-to-face -face inter interface. And across this range of structures, we got uh, between an 18 and 35% improvement in the power delay product uh, in each of these examples, which is a dramatic improvement that has come about simply because of this automated flow shortening wires. Finally, I'd like to talk about work we've been doing in thermal system level design. We've put together an entire uh, what we call pathfinding flow, which we call Pathfinder 3D, that goes from a, a, a high-level design, including a rough floor plan, and allows predictions such as power consumption, static temperature profile, and dynamic temperature profile through this tool flow. This is the details of the, the back-end flow for temperature extraction. We actually extract, uh, a, a, a we build a thermal model uh, based on the chip floor plan and the technology file. And we can either s solve that to get static thermal predictions or transient thermal predictions. Next, I'm going to apply this flow to a, rather s to a somewhat simplified uh, case study. Here we have two possible 3D floor plans for a, a multi-core processor. Here, the, we stack the memories and stack the processors this is the heat sink, and this is a three chip stack. On the right hand side, we alternate the memories and the processors within the stack. Again, we have a three chip stack with the heat sink on the bottom. Now, if I asked you which is more, which will give a better temperature profile, you would naturally say the structure on the right, because we, we don't stack hot CPUs like we do in the left, we intersperse them with cooler running uh, memories, which have a lower heat flux. And you'll be right. Here's a detailed thermal map of these two cases. The structure on the right achieves about a 10 degree lower static temperature than the structure on the left. However, if you ran this through a, a transient simulator, you'd see a very different result. And the reason is because 
the heating from the CPUs heats the L2 caches, increasing their leakage power and thus uh, increasing their temperature. We affected a thermal runaway effect because of this leakage power. It turns out that the left-hand design is actually 20 degrees cooler in a transient simulation scenario. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Here I've presented different scenarios and the power consumption saving, the, the improvements they give in performance per unit power. And before I finish off, I'd like to thank the companies that fund this, uh, as, uh, as well as all the students and postdocs and other faculty whose work I've largely presented here. So thank you very much. My email was on the first slide, and I'll be happy to answer any questions by email uh, if there are any. Thanks again.